Network, home of Electronic Editions, the modern, the modern home for smart technology, and the best tech deals online, baby. So if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to our channel by clicking the like and subscribe button. It gives uh, YouTube it gives uh, YouTube a good algorithm. Also, it lets us know that we're doing a good job as well. All right. So without further ado, let's bring you guys some crazy sparkling tech news. All right. So first and foremost, uh, OLED TVs. So L O L E D TVs could look quite different in a few years time compared to today. While OLED is genu uh, generally considered the big TV of the moment with its infinite contrast ratio, color accuracy, and deep blacks, there's no denying that it would stay top dog forever, at least not without some further innovations beyond the capabilities of its picture. So that's kind of crazy, guys. You know, when you're thinking about OLED TVs, they're already looking nice i mean the visuals are already um you know on point they're already looking crazy now you're, they're saying that they could receive eye tracking sensors right but uh people are saying do we actually need them right so this is according to uh tech radar and if we go into the article um you know not long after we heard from Panasonic that the picture quality of OLED sets had pretty much peaked and we got the opportunity to speak with CEO and co-founder of OTI Luminix, Michael Hillander, about the technical advancements that could end up the way we interact with OLED TVs in the future, including baked in sensors for tracking our eyes, heads and hands. That sounds super cool. Now, what is OLED? So the TV panel explained. First, some background, OTI Luminex is a specialty materials company, one that works across the electronics industry to, as its CEO puts it, help drive new user experiences. Beyond the interactive improvements we usually see in TV makers' annual product ranges, it, re it receives large amount of investments from LG Display, which is the only manufacturer of LED panels for TVs and clearly has a big stack in driving innovation in the space, right? So they're saying that we really focus on the solutions, on new user experiences, rather than, you know, helping to drive small incremental improvements to make your daily slightly brighter and slightly reduce power consumption, says Helander. That's not just, that's just not interesting from a user perspective, right? So you, many people, have, I mean, this is going to create a whole new world, right? So new TV ranges are often uh, disappointed in the lack of big sustainable, uh, sustainable changes in the 2021 LG TV range. For example, the major technical changes seem to be the introduction of a tripod TV stand and an OLED Evo technology design to make the gallery series OLED took I mean, to look marginally brighter, right? But exactly can OTI or any of the major players in the TV space actually innovate in? So in Hollander's opinion, the most exciting development in OLED is the integration of the display with different types of sensors and cameras, which definitely would make sense. This is something we see for more commonly in the world of smartphones where uh, a need of embedded front-facing cameras and facial recognition centers have to grapple with desire for all screen bezel banishing designs with the exception of so-called uh, notch cameras where else can these things go if not under the screen itself so Helanda explains that in the mobile phones we're starting to see the first generation of products under display cameras directly integrated into the display and kind of hidden under the active pixels we're anticipating some feature products under display face id and other and other types of ir sensors too but as we figure out on how to do the same thing with oled tvs whole new opportunities for interacting could open up Helander tells us that the ability to have a camera or built-in ir sensors that can track your eyes your face your hands it opens up new possibilities for new interaction with the display and the content 
right? So it's OTI's development in cathode patter patterning, in particular, the process by which uh, negatively charged electrodes are let are latticed behind OLED panel to channel electricity towards it that are enabling under display sensors, allowing the total design freedom when, desi when deciding how this layer of cathodes is made and arranged and what could be placed in between the gaps, right? So we're wondering, you know, why does this matter? We're talking about all this tech stuff, you know, why does this actually matter to the average consumer? Well, it's unlikely that this will have a much an immediate impact on your souped up home cinema through Helander, right? Home cinema, though Helander suggests, right? That head tracking could lead to spatial audio functionality the way that Apple has done with AirPod Pros, AirPod Max by tracking the position of your head. You can do the same thing in a home cinema setting, at least for an individual watching TV. It's possible too that this could have an impact in the world of gaming with sensors able to track your eyes, head, or gestures for navigating an in-game environment as with Microsoft Connect camera for Xbox 360. So, that, I mean, obviously guys, that would be pretty sick. I mean, you know, you have facial recognition on the TV and you're actually paying, you're, you know, you're playing online. Uh, this obviously probably would work with just one person, but I would definitely like to see, um, you know, definitely like a video of what they're talking about more live, you know, so that, that would be pretty cool, right? So it's possible too, that this could have an impact in the world of gaming, right? So Hollander admits that the main use of the case for TV screen packed with sensors and cameras is probably an office setting for video conferencing so that when you're looking at someone on the screen, you're actually looking at their eyes. They're looking at your eyes and becomes a much more engaging experience. When you think about the size of the TV, says Hollander, that's really large area where you can put quite a lot of different sensors, even starting to get some depth mapping data and other types of 3d scanning just by having multiple sensors placed behind in this way so that's pretty cool guys right um of course manufacturers will still have to pack those sensors in somewhere with some of the designs you see from sony there's still a large box of electronics mounted at the back of the panel in the center region where you could accommodate a lot of those sensors and still have the edge of the panel uh could be very that could be very thin right so or if you look at the wallpaper thin lg wx oled that may be a little bit more difficult to integrate some types of sensors and optics but of course people are getting better and better at squeezing down the space that all these types of sensors need for smartphones as there are limitations on just how physical space you have how much physical space you actually have in very slim phones so again i think a lot of the technology there is going to get adopted into the largest size panels. The exact uses of these sensors is unclear at the moment, and we expect it will be quite a few years before they come baked into the average home television. It's obvious though that new ways of interfacing with our devices are emerging and a matter of time before mainstream product makes a strong case for them. So that would be, guys, that would be very interesting. I really hope that um, Panasonic or LG um, or one of the, you know, one of uh, main brands that actually manufactures, produces, uh, and delivers OLED TVs comes out with an actual video, you know, just showing how this product, how this process would look like. This would be very interesting. And I think a lot of people would actually move from actual regular OLED TVs to these highly censored OLED TVs, right? This could be nice for gaming. Uh, this could be good for entertainment, watching movies, maybe even for, uh, you know, um, you know, at home workouts too. Um, and when you're thinking about just doing anything using the TV where you're, you know, you're listening to music, you can even probably create a dance app where, you know, you know, it's kind of like just dance. I don't know if you guys, you know, have heard about that, have seen that game, 
but you know if it could have like a sensor where the tv matches your movements that without even having a console but just straight up in the tv through the apps that it, it already comes with that would just be amazing right so you know that's that's definitely uh some good big news right there too all right so you got Xiaomi Mi 11 launch date confirmed. We'll see the Samsung Galaxy S21 rival very soon. So after launching in China on December 28th, we've been waiting for a global launch of Xiaomi 11, as it could be the Samsung Galaxy S21's biggest rival. We now know the phone's launch event is set for February 8th, this comes from an event invitation sent to Tech Radar, citing the launch start as 1 p.m. CET, right? So the launch start, um, so pretty much for, you know, uh, it's pretty much 7 a.m. Eastern uh, time, 4 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Uh, GMT time, and et cetera, right? So get ready for that launch. Uh, that is going to be pretty dope, guys. Honestly, that's going to be, you know, really, really cool. All right. For you Xiaomi fans out there. Xiaomi, Xiaomi. I love that name. So Microsoft's uh, your phone, right? So Windows 10 is now you know, now runs multiple Android apps with your phone. So Microsoft's Your Phone app now allows uh, for the opening of multiple Android apps on your Windows 10 desktop. Instead of just one application, if you have a supported Samsung handset, right? That is. As you may recall, this feature was implemented in testing back in November 2020 after official support for running a single Android app arrived in September. However, multiple apps are now officially supported if you have certain models of more recent Samsung phones, right? So let's see what they're talking about, right? So um this seems really cool so app mirroring on the desktop has moved from testing to rolling out officially right so uh you know the full list of supported samsung handsets can be found here and bear in mind you must also be running windows 10 of may 2020 update or better when it comes to your pc right you also need your phone app version uh 1.2 0.132, right? If you're running those versions, you guys know what version of Android that you're running. So if you don't know, check in your settings and you guys will already know. So furthermore, to run multiple apps, Android 11.0 is required on your supported Samsung phone as well as the link to Windows app, right? Finally, you'll need, uh, you'll need link to Windows service app version 2.1. 0.05.2 or better from the Galaxy Store as MS Power user makes clear. Oh, and naturally enough, your PC and phone need to be on the same Wi-Fi network for any of your phone uh, for for your phone to be compatible and able to do that. Right. So are there any other phones that can do that? Right. So running Android apps on your Windows 10 desktop is a nifty feature indeed. And using more than one simultaneously uh, is further boon. Although many people are still unhappy that this Samsung only feature when it comes to phones, from what we heard from Microsoft at the end of last year, that situation won't change any time in the near future, but it may do eventually. Getting it to work is not a trivial endeavor, but by any means, but Microsoft has said it's exploring new ways to bring your phone features to other handsets besides Samsung models, so we can keep our fingers crossed. Meanwhile, the phone app recently had another feature added, albeit just in testing, namely the ability to check your phone signal strength and Wi-Fi strength, as well as battery level at a glance on the desktop. At the moment, this feature has only rolled out to limited set of testers, though. So all right, that's pretty interesting, guys, right? And if you want to learn more about, um, you know, the um, 
if you want to learn about you know the different handsets that you know are available uh, for this compatibility you know in order to work with your phone and your Windows device you can go and check this article out we'll leave a link in the description so you can go on our LinkedIn page follow us on LinkedIn go in this article and check out more information okay so so this is also pretty big news guys um, looks like there's a new there's a Plex TV app right so what devices can I use with this Plex TV app um, I've personally never heard of Plex before but it looks like they may have been around they may have been working up until now that they may have got recognition now but it looks like um, cord cutting was once seen as a relatively impractical option given the dominance of cable TV, but it's getting easier every year as new apps continue to offer unbeatable deals on live TV. Plex is rapidly growing live TV platform with other 100 free channels and several advanced features available for just for a few dollars per month. And our Flex TV reviews, or Plex TV reviews, we laud the platform's incredible value, unmatched flexibility, and intuitive interface. Here we'll cover the basics of the service how it compares to cable and other streaming apps and which devices you can currently use the Plex TV app on. So let's see what devices you can use the Plex TV app on. Hopefully on Android and iOS and Apple, just like the main hitters. So computers, uh, mobiles, console, smart TV, streaming devices, right? So let's see here. Many, many, many of you may be asking, what is Plex TV? And I'm asking the same thing myself. Plex TV is a free live and streaming service designed as an all-in-one media platform, along with a list of more than 100 free channels. Plex also has more than 20,000 free movies from some of the top production companies. While Plex can be somewhat confusing to set up, it is one of the most convenient ways to rid of cable, and it's an outstanding package considering that it's available for no charge. It also has a surprisingly sleek design. All right, so that is pretty cool. Apart from being able to stream content from Plex's expansive media collection, you can also bring your own content. Plex allows users to host their own media files, shows, movies, documentaries, and more, and stream them from the device of their choosing. Your own desktop asks, acts as the Plex media server, streaming content to other devices in your network via the platform. If you want to get more out of Plex, you can play a reasonably priced subscription. You can pay a reasonably priced subscription for the Plex Pass subscription. A great feature worth mentioning is the built-in DVR, which allows you to sync content across devices and download it locally for online or I mean for offline access. Plex Pass also integrates with Sonos, supports virtual reality, and has a comprehensive set of advanced options. So which device does Plex support? Unlike some streaming services that only offer apps on a small range of devices, Plex is available on almost anything you can think of. You can use it on your computer and iOS, like I was saying before, smartphones and tablets through the Plex TV mobile app. Similarly, Plex apps are on the, mo on the most gaming systems, um, including the PS5, PS4, PS3, Xbox 360, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and S. Going even further, users can access their Plex accounts on Chromecast, Amazon Fire TV, and, uh, Apple TV, Android TV, Amazon Echo, and most smart TVs as well. Plex automatically stores your progress across every device that associates uh, with your account, so you, no need to worry about keeping track of where you can where you left off. It can transcode content to ensure that your shows and movies play on um, every device you own. Even some devices don't support the original file format. So just be careful of that. So the Plex TV app, what devices can I use? So um, Plex is one of the most intriguing additions into the streaming landscape, and it supports a wide range of devices, making an accessible option for almost any 
user. So you can easily access uh, Plex TV app using a tablet, smartphone, computer, smart TV, gaming console, streaming device, and even Amazon Echo. The platform's convenient tools for cross-platform access make it even easier to use across every device you own. So that is pretty interesting, guys. Um, you know, personally, I've never heard of Plex, but I'll definitely uh, we'll definitely take a look at it and probably play with around with it a little later. So it's a free live streaming service, guys. So anything free, guys, and you know, it has more than 20,000 free movies from some of the top production companies. And for the the and the crazy thing about this, guys, if you are a content creator, if you um, you know, if you do production, if you video, uh, if you're an actor, if you want to get big, you don't have to rely on some of these other streaming companies to get your content out there. You can actually go and put out more content, your own content on the Plex streaming service. And hey, if you can get big at that, that that's awesome. That's that's amazing, right? So so when you're thinking about getting big guys obviously plex tv the streaming service already has an audience right they already have uh, an audience right it may not be or you know subscribers they may not be as much as netflix or as much as comcast or peacock which is relatively new uh or even hulu but at the end of the day um they are definitely getting bigger right so if you're trying if you're a content creator you're looking you're trying to get on netflix you can on netflix this may be your shot to put your own content on the platform and put yourself on since it's a free streaming service now it may not always be free in the future right so really take that in consideration as well all right so right so another big uh pretty interesting news um which is news that we've been talking about ever since our previous episodes here at Electronic News Network. Um, pretty much Apple iPhone 12S or iPhone 13. What will Apple call its next smartphone? We've, been most, we've mostly been referring to Apple's next numbered iPhone as the iPhone 13. But is that actually what will launch as? Given that it follows the iPhone 12, it would make sense for it to, but there are a couple of reasons why it may not, right? So let's see um, what Apple is thinking about it. Let's go into the article more to see uh, what's going on. So there's some debate about over the next iPhone, okay? So, um, so we'll look at the reasons at those what are the reasons why what apple might call the next major iphone instead with iphone 12s being the most likely alternative option but not the only ones right so what do the rumors say so far we'll also cover and consider how likely an alternative name actually is and as soon as we hear anything else about the name we'll be sure to update you guys um as well right so an inconsistent pattern. why might apple not call its next major iphone the iphone 13. one reason is that sometimes follow you know sometimes follows up uh, a numbered model with an s version for example the iphone 6 was followed by the iphone 6s if you guys definitely remember that um but this right that's not a pattern Apple always sticks to. In fact, the last S model was the iPhone XS. So the iPhone 12 followed the iPhone 11 with the iPhone 11S in between. So if Apple continues with what, uh, with what it's been doing for the last couple of years, then we can expect the iPhone 13, right? But if it goes back to using an S, then we'll likely get the iPhone 12s, an unlucky number. Another reason Apple might not go for the uh, number 13 is that it's seen as an unlucky number in many parts of the world, including Apple's home market of the US. Of course, calling the next phone the iPhone 12s wouldn't entirely solve uh, this problem because Apple would still 
then be up to 13 the following year. So what did the rumors say, guys? It's all this is all speculation. Apple didn't roll out any name for the new iPhone. What does the rumor say? The earliest rumors about the next main iPhone largely referred to as the iPhone 13, but it's not clear whether the sources have heard that would be the name or just assuming it would be. And more recently, a few sources have specifically said that it will be called the iPhone 12s. For example, Bloomberg reports that the engineers inside Apple considered the upcoming model to the S version, though that doesn't necessarily mean it would launch with an S in its name. Right, so John Prosser, a leaker with the reasonable track record, has also suggested that the next model will be called the iPhone 12s, as have J China and Digitimes, also other sources as well. Ross Young, a display industry expert, uh, has accurately leaked things in the past, <clears throat> also refers to the upcoming phones as the iPhone 12S range, though notes that he's not sure whether that will be the final name. Notably, no sources at the time of writing have specifically come out and said that the phones will be called the iPhone 13. So based on the evidence at the moment, iPhone 12S is actually looking more likely, right? <clears throat> Interesting, what's in a name, right? It's worth noting that if Apple does choose to call its next iPhone the iPhone 12S, this won't have been done at random and could in fact single the next model iPhone uh, will be relatively minor update that's not worthy of a new number. That's speculation for now, especially if it's early in the days for iPhone 13 rumors, but it's something that to bear in mind, especially as early rumors do suggest the design might be similar to iPhone 12s, right? So that's pretty much the deal, guys. Um, it's all speculation for right now. Many sources and uh, other people that have been following Apple for a long time are saying that the next phone could be the iPhone 12S, you know, but we don't know. CEO Apple, Tim Cook, can change the name. He can, you know, do anything at the last second. So whatever uh, these reporters and these sources are saying, it's just pure speculation. We don't know. Honestly, if they do come out with 12S, that's fine. If they come out with the 13, uh, personally, that's fine with me too. I just hope that the name doesn't matter really what matters is the actual phone the software and how it actually conducts and actually works and how society can uh, use it for the betterment but we will see for sure all right and also lastly we have sony uh puria com you know compact uh the release date price news rumors and just how small it could be so Obviously, if you guys have been following Sony, if you guys know Sony, uh, the Xperia, I know they had the original Xperia. They have different models of the Xperia. The last one I remember was pretty bigger than that that we're seeing right now. Um, and just the design, the dis you know, the display looks, you know, incredible. It's fast. It's, you know, definitely intuitive to use right so let's check out more about this compact version right so it, it definitely the you know the previous versions were a lot bigger like i said so it looks like this one's compact right so we haven't seen a new small body sony phone since 2018 sony xperia x22 compact despite the protestations of fans who want a device that's easy to use in one hand since then, rumors of a Sony Xperia Compact handset have abounded, right? With each new generation of Xperia phones expected to have a mini sibling and each new wave coming without said device, right? So let's look at the release date and the rumors about this. Let's see and let's go uh, into more information. Right, so we see here at this point all hope is nearly lost of seeing the Sony Xperia Compact device, right? 
Um, but that hasn't stopped people speculating. And lots of tech fans are expecting to see it land alongside the Sony Xperia 1 3 line in mid-2021, right? While we've been through this before, there's no compact Xperia 1 2 or uh, Xperia 1 or Xperia XC3 that hasn't stopped some leakers getting excited about the prospect of the phone. We've collected all the leaks below so you can see what people are saying about the Sony Xperia Compact and will this article um, and we'll keep this article updated as credible information comes in, right? And no, this isn't an article about Sony Xperia 5 while that and Xperia five two are certainly smaller than their one series equivalents they're still not small enough to count as compact right so um you know multiple sony xperia compact rumors point to having a 5.5 inch screen broken up to teardrop notch the source linked above suggests it'll have a snapdragon 700 series chip another says it will only have two rear cameras which makes the phone sound pretty mid-range right that latter uh, leaker was joined by unofficial render right so we're seeing here another leaker, uh, Steve H. McFly uh, on Twitter, 